All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to, to speak about hip preservation surgery and being someone who performs both hip preservation and hip replacement surgery. I think one of the biggest advancements has been in surgical decision making on who, uh, whose hip we save and whose we, uh, we replace. Um, so for a talk, I think it makes sense to start with speaking about hip replacement surgery. So hip replacements are great surgeries. Uh, hard techniques are, are less invasive. It doesn't matter whether it's anterior approach or posterior approach, our incisions are smaller, it's less invasive and our implants are better. Um, people are recovering faster. It's certainly not a wide awake surgery, uh, but it's moved into the realm of an outpatient surgery. Uh, long-term, our results are great, um, and there's very few long-term restrictions on patients. Uh, but why not total hip replacement for everybody? Well, the things that I worry about the most in patients who are candidates for both surgeries, I would say infection is my number one concern. Uh, you know, it, if you choose a hip preservation surgery, you can always do a hip replacement later, but if you replace a hip, there's no going back. And if somebody has an infection, you know, it, it, it hits a bad problem. The uh, things can spiral out of control very quickly, um, and uh, it can certainly affect outcome. For patients who ha uh, do a lot of high impact activities or a lot of high range of motion activities, it can also be an issue. Uh, we see a lot of people who have hip replacements and are happy because they have less pain, but they don't necessarily have have normal range of motion. And in fact, I've, I've been pretty surprised how tight a lot of hips feel after hip replacement. So if somebody uh, is, is very interested in yoga or another high range of motion activity, uh, hip replacements may not be best uh, for that patient. And then also, uh, we, we're starting to have more concerns about late periprosthetic fractures. Uh, they can certainly happen at the time of surgery, but it's, it's less common and it's a little bit easier to manage. Uh, the bigger problem, I think, are in people in their 80s or 90s who have well-functioning hip replacements now. Uh, as, as people are older and bone density is less, I think that's gonna be problematic. There's a lot of long-term unknown implications of hip replacement. People who have them in their 30s or 40s, they're gonna to need to last a long time, and we know what happens about 30 years out from hip replacement uh, because that's how long our data is, but we don't know what happens 60 years out, and there could be a lot of issues that we're not aware of. And then also, I think for patient preferences, you have to respect people's thoughts. A lot of people don't want a hip uh, made out of metal and plastic, and that's very reasonable, um, so we, we think that the best hip you'll ever have is your own hip, and if we can save it, we think that's a good thing. Uh, we, we, from time to time, are doing hip replacements in young patients, and for people who don't have another option, I think it's a great option. It can certainly be something that is life-changing for them, but it can also be a total disaster, depending on how things go. Um, you can see the patient in, in the picture on the right is 34 years old. She has a very large stem. She has a, a very large socket as well. She had a couple of infections and has a very large implant, and she's only 34. So things can spiral out of control very quickly, and if she needs further revisions in her lifetime, it's gonna be very problematic. You know, we think when we put implants in people who are 30 years old, they'll probably need one to two revisions in their lifetime if everything is perfect. Um, and that's problematic because with each revision, it's a more invasive procedure, there's higher complication rates, the implants are larger, and the, the, the ones they currently have are harder and harder to, uh, to, to remove from the bones. So we think about these things in, in terms of a precautionary principle. Um, we only have data out to 30 years on these implants. They do very well at that time point. They probably will uh, do well for much longer, um, but a lot of these need to last 60 to 80 years with some of the people that have really severe hip problems. Um, and if they have a complication, it snowballs very quickly. So in general, if we can save a hip, uh, we, we like to try. So what is hip preservation? It really is the, the science and the art of treating hip pain prior to arthritis and dealing with symptoms and dysfunction that patients have now. We think about uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, 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 put off or avoid a hip replacement later. It's really a secondary benefit. Most of these patients we see have a lot of pain and dysfunction now, and we're, we're a little less worried about the future. So it combines a lot of different subspecialties, both uh, 
pediatric orthopedics with some of the open procedures, sports medicine with the arthroscopy, and then also for some patients, uh, hip replacement's an option as well. And the diagnosis of these problems is complex and it takes a lot of time. And that's why it's still not very much talked about because the availability is limited because it's very difficult. It takes a long time to speak with patients and figure out what their diagnosis is to work through their problems. And then the treatment of it is also very time intensive. The, the whole field is predicated on identifying an underlying problem with the hip, hip mechanics. So the nice thing about the hip joint is it's very mechanical. Most problems are related to a mismatch of the shape of the ball in the socket. And if we understand what that is, we have an opportunity to fix it prior to a patient having arthritis. Now the diagnosis of hip problems is really what drives our management. Um, and we spent a lot of time trying to understand the hip in the past 15, 20 years, and I think we have a much better understanding of it now. Um, the question of whether or not your pain is related to your hip is a hard enough question uh, to answer in and of itself. So we do a lot of diagnostic injections in our office. We do uh, injections into hip joints, hint tendons to try and understand is your problem really related to your hip or is it not or perhaps you have multiple problems which one is the primary driver of your pain so it's uh, it's complicated and it takes time most patients uh, are, are funneled into one of two diagnoses if they don't have arthritis it's usually either hip impingement or a mismatch of the shapes of the hip joint um, and there's different types of impingement and they can mimic many different things uh, it can certainly uh, mimic pelvic pain it can mim uh, mimic spinal stenosis, it can mimic a lot of things. So there's a lot of people who are complex who come in to have these problems evaluated. And hip instability is also a major problem and very hard to diagnose in a lot of patients. You can see in the 3D CT on the bottom right, that person has a normal lateral uh, center edge angle or marker for instability that most of us look for, um, but they have essentially no anterior wall. So they have anterior uh, insufficiency and femoral antiversion and a highly unstable hip that's uh, sometimes very easy to to misdiagnose. We see a lot of hip instability uh, present as uh, psoas tendonitis. So, so a lot of your patients who have a recalcitrant uh, hip flexor problem may have instability and high antiversion. It's always something to think about. So beyond that, when we do treat it, uh, we think about a lot of different things. So hip arthroscopy is certainly the best way to treat the intraarticular space. You can see things very well. It's very easy to manage them. Um, and it's uh, it's not very invasive from a surgical perspective. I think from a rehab perspective, it is much more invasive, so it takes a long time to recover from the surgery. Um, it, it's partial weight bearing for a period of time, six weeks until we start actively strengthening you, and people are returning to running at about uh, three months and sport at four months. So it takes a long time uh, to recover from, but the advantages are you still have your own native hip and it will function better with much less pain. There's been a lot of advances, uh, primarily with uh, computer-assisted uh, resection guides uh, and better implants uh, from the manufacturers. So PAO surgery or periacetabular osteotomy is a surgery that we normally do in people in their 20s and 30s. It's the most powerful tool we have to fix a hip problem prior to a patient having arthritis. Um, it used to be more invasive and is now much less invasive. We made, uh, we've, we've learned how to make smaller incisions. Uh, can preserve all the muscles so no muscles are cut at the time of surgery. Um, it really has a similar recovery with hip arthroscopy in terms of your return to active strengthening. Uh, most patients who, who have the surgery very quickly feel better. They feel like their hip feels normal and they're able to walk on it, uh, you know, essentially at four weeks after surgery for our younger patients. Um, and a lot of people have uh, have their other side done shortly after. We've started doing the, those with hip arthroscopy and that makes our incision smaller and it allows us to treat all problems with the hip at the same time, one surgery, uh, one recovery. And it's, it's, it, it's becoming more commonly done and for the people who think that it's a morbid procedure or is rare or not commonly done, there's a Facebook group with 8,000 members who post about 30 times a day on, on various issues and all these patients are very, very happy and I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, Another part of hip preservation surgery are the muscles and tendons around the hip joint. We, we very much have an interest in non-operative management and trying to understand hip muscle function and how to improve it. Um, and as a part of that, we also diagnose and manage a lot of tears, uh, both full thickness and partial thickness tears of the hamstring, hand gluteus tendons. And we've learned how to do this endoscopically or through a camera surgery in a minimally invasive way. And there's a lot of things that that, uh, 
that, that, that we can do in that space. And we borrowed a lot of, uh, a lot of things uh, from the shoulder surgeons as well, and we've started doing some biologic augmentation and some patches as well on some of the partial thickness tears, which we think is improving outcomes and allowing patients to rehab faster. So to finish the talk, uh, the biggest question, who do we repair, who do we replace? And it's, the answer is it depends and it's complicated. People in their, in their, in their 20s and early 30s, we, we usually prefer preservation. People over 60, we usually prefer replacement. But there's a lot of people in the middle in between ages 30 and 60 that are complex and are candidates for both surgeries. There's a lot of them that are kind of difficult to think about. Uh, there's some 40-year-old females who have hip dysplasia and uh, hip <coughs> hypermobility who don't have arthritis that might be a candidate for either procedure because there's not great options. So there's a lot of things. What we do is we try to understand the patient, uh, what their patient reported outcome scores are, uh, what's the delta in improvement that this patient is looking for. Um, we try to understand the hip, make sure we have the right clinical diagnosis. Do we understand what the problem is? Because if we don't, we're not gonna be able to treat it. Um, we try to understand our treatments, uh, and I think having some uh, being with uh, a, a center or a person who has an understanding of both hip preservation and replacement really helps talk through the risks and benefits of each of the procedures and pick the right one for you. And the most important part of it we've learned are patient preferences. People who are very focused on having a fast uh, fast recovery are probably much better candidates for hip replacement surgery because it's a much easier, faster recovery, if you can believe that. Um, Reoperation is also a factor too. If you want a one and done surgery and you never want to have surgery again, hip replacement might be that surgery for you. But there are patients who have a lot of fears about hip replacement surgery, who have had family members who have had bad experiences, or they have fears about the long-term implications. And if you're, uh, if you're a patient who's a candidate for either surgery, uh, it, that that person might be better for hip preservation surgery just based upon their own fears and preferences. So these, uh, these factors are things that we think about and probably the our decision making is the biggest advancement in trying to decide who's a candidate for this, uh, this rapidly advancing field. Thank you.